What's up, ladies and gentlemen? It's your boy Alex Mack here in the building. I'm here with the one and only Randy Ojeda. Yes, sir, one of the Radio Ojeda Esquire. Esquire. Yeah. Yes, sir. Yes, yeah. sir. One of the premier uh, music lawyers in the area here. Uh, I feel like the more you get plugged into the Tampa scene, the more you meet people, the more you see how many roads lead back to the music lawyer, you know, specifically yeah. Mr. Randy Ojeda. Yeah. So, how you doing today? Doing good. Doing good. Just, uh, you know, living the dream, making the magic happen, you know. Yeah. Every day, getting a little... And you said this is a bigger office too, so exactly investing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I was I used to be in um, the smallest office that this building had, so it was uh, forty square feet. It was basically like just this kind of square here. Um, but now you know this office is much bigger, so I can have bands in here. You know, I can have artists in here, and you know, really like do it right. You know, so it's it's good stuff. Sweet. How long have you been practicing law for? Um, about four years now. Um, so I, I, I kind of had a little bit of a roundabout way to, to my law practice. So I actually, I went to law school first. Um, and then while I was in law school, I started managing, um, an artist, you know, um, and then started managing more artists and more bands and all these people. And then, uh, rather than take the bar and, and, do the law thing. I just I just decided to stick with management. I was like, this is this is fun. This is what I love, you know. And um, I did management. Then I did A and R for Symphonic Distribution. Did that for a while. Um, you know, ran a label. I did a whole you know wore a bunch of different music industry hats, you know. And then I um, then during the pandemic was actually when I was like you know, thinking about it. And I had met more music lawyers at that point and kind of learned what they do and, you know, realized that I, I could do it too, you know? So pandemic was a good reset time, you know, everybody, everything stopped. I, you know, touring and everything stopped. So I didn't have a lot to do. So I spent that time studying again and took the bar exam here in Florida and started my law practice. Sweet. Yeah. yeah. I love those like story trajectories where it's like I started off over here and I saw that over there, yeah. but I kept going over here doing this, and then something happened in my life where it was like, what if I kind of peek back over there? Yeah, yeah, exactly. It's 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 just one of those things where I didn't really know, you know, in law school they don't really teach you music law, you know, so you ha you kind of have to learn the industry on your own. And I, you know, when I was managing and doing A and R and doing these other things that's when I really learned the music industry, you know, and then I already had the legal background. So I was just able to, to put them together and, and do what I do now. It's kind of crazy to think of that. Like, you know, they're teaching you law in a general sense. And it's kind of up to you to choose your niche and figure out more. Exactly. Yeah. So, I mean, obviously like I spent a lot of time learning contracts, which at the end of the day is what music law is. It's just mm -hmm. all contracts and, um, you know, deals, negotiating deals and stuff. So, um, yeah, it was, uh, it, it, it works. It works. But it definitely, you know, it took me a little while to get to the point that I'm at. How would you say, uh, what about is that like reading Donald Passman's book? <laughs> definitely that... reading Passman's book. Yeah, I've, I've read every edition of Passman's book that I, I could know. get my hands on. You know, that's so, so that's all you need to know about the music business by Donald Passman. It is, you know, if I ever teach a music industry course, which, spoiler alert, I might be teaching a music industry course soon. Shout out. That, um... That would be my textbook. Is is Donald Passman's "All You Need to Know About the Music Business"? It's, you know, it really is all you need to know about the music business. It gives you a great overview of everything in the industry, um, and it's written by Donald Passman, who is a lawyer. So, you know, there's some stuff in there about being a lawyer and about working with lawyers that's really helpful. So, yeah, great book. Yeah, one of my favorite parts about it is they actually structures it for different types of readers too. It's like if you want to learn everything. Read it like a normal book. Yeah. If you just want to kind of like as an artist, maybe I just want to know a little bit of here and there. It teaches you actually how to skim the book type. Yeah, yeah. No, that's that's true. And that's a good that's a good way to do it. Yeah. yeah. Uh, kind of curious about you said you started off doing artist management. Mm -hmm. Now, what is something that most either artists or people who just pop up on you like, yo, I should be a manager, bro. What's the, <laughs> what do they uh, not know or don't see until they actually get into the nitty gritty? Oh man, so much, you know, you don't realize like how much work goes into artist management. Cause I mean, you're really like, especially if you're starting early on with an artist, it's like you're, you're in there grinding day in and day out with the artists and you're, you know, 
you're really trying to build things from the ground floor. So I think the I think a manager is the toughest job in the industry because you really have to know a little bit about every aspect of the industry because you're involved in everything, you know. So, you know, definitely if you're an artist manager and you're new to the game, you know, lean on the experts, you know, get your artist a business manager to help with the finances, get them a lawyer to help with the contracts, you know, get a publicist or whatever to help with the publicity and the PR aspect, but but learn everything, you know, so that you can properly manage. I mean, you got to be able to, to delegate. You got to be able to, um, you know, get in there and, 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 and get the job done, you know, sometimes with little to no resources, you know. So, yeah, it's, it's you got to be crafty. You got you to gotta work hard. It's a, it's a tough gig for sure. Would the artist manager, is it fair to say that they're kind of like the CEO of the artist's business or not quite? Yeah. No, no, I think that's fair. I'm Well, I don't know. I think the artist is still the CEO of the artist business, you know. I'd say the manager would be like the COO, you mm-hmm. know, the operating officer. So, you know, at the end of the day, the, the an artist should be in charge of their business and they should know the direction that they want to go and what they want to do, you know, within their time in the industry, you know, but um, it's up to the manager to kind of execute that vision and make sure that 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 follows through. So I would say, you know, maybe the artist is a CEO, manager, COO, you know, lawyers, your CLO, chief legal officer, you know. <laughs> yeah, it's about having a whole team. Right? Exactly. It, it really does take a village to, to make this music thing happen. Yeah. How would you say most artists go about building a team? Have you noticed? Is it just like I got a cousin over here? I got yeah. the, or what? What is the most effective way? Maybe you've seen too. No, sometimes I think that that works. You know, because um, and Passman talks about this in his book, where if you're if you're picking a manager, right, you either need an experienced manager who knows the industry, who's been doing it a while, who has connections, or you need somebody that's going to die for you. You know. And it's hard, it's, it, it's hard to find either of those people, but I think it's harder to find an experienced manager who's willing to take on a younger new artist than it is to find your friend or your, your, your cousin or whoever who's like so invested in what you do and believes in what you do that they're willing to go the extra mile to, to learn and to make stuff happen. And sometimes that can be just as valuable as the experience, you know, because they're, they care, you know. Hmm. Um, but in terms of going about building a team, you know, I would, I would just lean on whoever's willing to help you to start out, you know, um, obviously you got to have some oversight and make sure they're not just, you know, throwing your career away, but you, you, you want to work with people that want to work with you and, and believe in you. And if that's your cousin, if that's your friend, if that's, you know, whoever, you know, I'd say start with that team and, and rock with them. And, you know, there's, there's, plenty of stories of people that started out as a friend of a friend and now they're big in the industry because, you know, they believed in this one person and they, they helped build what they were doing. Mm-hmm. You said a term earlier when we were uh, grabbing some coffee, shout out to you, thank you for the coffee. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you said that you were genre agnostic. Yes. So I thought that was very interesting because like you as a music lawyer, we kind of say it kind of comes with the territory. Yeah. Me as a producer, I kind of feel like the more I stay like that, mm-hmm. the more I like don't just listen to the same genre all the time, the better like my music vocabulary or whatever it is. How would you say your passion for music got developed? Uh, I mean, I've always been passionate about music. So, I mean, at a, at a young age, I picked up the guitar, um, moved over to the bass because all my friends already played guitar, so I was like, well, I got to play bass because somebody, somebody's got to play bass, yeah. you know. Um, so I switched over to the bass. I played in bands. You know, my first band was in middle school. You know, I played bands in high school, played in bands in college, and uh, just always, always loved music and, and all types of music, you know. Um, and, yeah, that I say I'm genre agnostic because I really do listen to everything. Like, you know, my my out the algorithm on Spotify for me is crazy. You know, like it, it has no idea what I want to listen to because, you know, I'll go, I'll go from, you know, classical music to, to indie rock, to, to pop, to hip hop, to, you know, electronic music, like whatever, I'll listen to anything. And most importantly, I'll work with anything, you know, like if you're, you know, my criteria for a client is just somebody that's working hard and, you know, doing what they do well, but what they do could be, could be any genre. Like that's, you know, 
that's fine with me. It's sometimes, you know, I, I, it's always great when I enjoy the music that, that my client is making, but you know, there's been times where it's, it's not a genre that I really listen to, but I appreciate the craft. I appreciate what they're putting into it, the time they're putting into it. And that's enough for me to, to want to represent them. Yeah. yeah. That's fair enough. Uh, so I was doing a little due diligence on your page. We actually connected over, um, was it threads? Was it Threads? I yeah, it yeah, was, yeah. yeah. Shout out to Threads. Threads is a it's a platform, you know. Yeah, yeah. I was going back, looking a little bit, seeing some of the stuff because you had mentioned that you wanted to get on a podcast and kind of be able to talk, chop up, chop a little. Yeah, bit, right? yeah. Oh no, I'm a I'm all about podcasts. So. so one of the things I saw pop up was something that I didn't know about. I'm sure most artists don't know about, but how would an artist go about trying to get a publishing advance as opposed to a record label advance? Oh yeah, that's a. Uh, that's a good question. So um, I talked about a couple different advances, but yeah, the, the publishing advance, you know, if you're, um, if you're, if you're making money off of the songwriting side of music, so whether that's as an artist or as a producer, actually producers can really benefit from publishing advances. You know, if you have a big enough catalog and you have a couple songs that maybe, you know, did, are doing pretty well, you might be eligible for a publishing advance and, and a publishing deal, you know, and there's, um, there's ways to, you know, so backing up, you know, one thing just so everybody understands, you know, there's two sides to a song, right? There's two, I, I talk about this a lot, there's two sides to every song. So you have the recorded portion or the, what they call the master side, and then you have the actual underlying song, the composition and publishing side. So, you know, record deals, they take the master side. Publishing deals, they take the composition side. So this is basically just another avenue that you can go in and, and monetize a certain part of your catalog without giving up the other side. You know, so you could still be releasing your music independently, you know, doing your thing on the master side, but then, you know, sell some of your publishing to make up make that advance, make up some money, you know, that you might need to reinvest in, in the studio or whatever you're doing, you know? So, um, yeah, I mean, look, you know, if you're doing your research and you're looking for record labels, also look at publishers, you know, do some search on, 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 you know, publishers. And sometimes it can be easier to get a publisher on board than it is to get a record label on board. Cause you know, it's, a, it's just a different world. And, you know, a publisher will exploit your, your catalog in ways like in, in like sync, you know, like they'll find ways to, you know, synchronize your music with TV shows or movies or commercials. And that's how they'll make up their, their portion of the advance. You know, that's how they'll make their money, you know, and that can be, you know, pretty lucrative in this day where, you know, I would say people don't buy music anymore, but companies buy music. So if you can sell your song to, you know, a TV show or a movie or a commercial, that's where a lot of the money is in this day and age, and a publisher can really help make that happen. Correct me if I'm wrong, but would publishing deal with the cover songs as opposed to master? Yeah, it would deal with uh, it would deal with cover songs as well. So, yeah. for certain genres, <clears throat> is it maybe more advantageous to go after a publishing deal because you know I'd say like country songs and those sort of things where maybe mm -hmm. there's more of a lane for covers versus a hip hop song. Yeah. Um, yeah, I would say that, that there's, there's definitely some more, some more room there. Um, especially if you're, if you're also, if you're writing songs for other people too, publishing is a good thing to look at. Like if you're, you know, a songwriter and you're writing for, you know, pop stars or whatever, writing verses for artists, you know, that can be a good, that can be a good avenue for sure. Hmm. Interesting. Uh, something that I've recently come across and, uh, I wasn't aware of it in the past, but an admin deal, is that something that's openly available for artists? What is the process for an artist to get an admin deal? Yeah, yeah. Admin deals are great. So they'll, um, you know, they will essentially, for a much lower percentage than a publisher would take, they will administrate your publishing and they'll, you know, collect your royalties on your behalf. They'll get international royalties. They'll, you know, they'll do the admin for you, essentially. Um and this is something, so there's, there's definitely small publishing admin companies that are a bit more selective, but then there's also, excuse me, there's also um, Song Trust, 
and uh, Centric and a couple of these other bigger companies that you can just sign up for a publishing admin service and they'll just, they'll, they'll take you, you know? Um, and I don't know exactly the fees. I think they take percentages, you know, but it's much lower. Like a publisher, um, might be a 50, 50 split with the artist, whereas a publishing admin company might only take 15% or something like mm-hmm. that. Um, but they'll still do, do good work for you. And it's really helpful to have to make sure you're not missing out on royalties. So I definitely, Definitely recommend getting a publishing admin company if you're at all interested in the world of publishing, but you're just like, oh my God, there's so much to do. I don't know. I don't know where to start. Pub admin could be a great way to, to, to get your feet wet in, in that industry. Yeah. That'd be helpful for like the DIY artists. I kind of consider myself one where it's like trying to manage so many different hats sometimes. Yeah. It's yeah, it is. It is. Um, it, that, that's a, that's a good way to do it. You know, song trust is great. Centric is great. You know, they, um, they make it easy to kind of go on the platform, register your songs, and then they take care of the rest. Sweet. Um, now, deviating a little bit from these kind of seems like niche contracts, right? What would a standard artist deal look like today? Would you say what type of freedoms would an artist be having to be willing to give up, I guess? For like a record deal? Yeah, like a standard record deal. Yeah. Um, well, that's the thing is what's standard is changing all the time and... Um, you know, there's not really as much of a standard anymore. So it it really is, uh, what you can negotiate and what you're able to get out of the deal, you know, and, and what leverage you have. But, um, I see a lot of the more traditional record deals, what, when people think of a record deal, they think of like the 360 contract, you know, where, you know, the record label's taking a little bit of everything and, you know, you're giving up, you know, 60, 70% of, of your royalties to this label and, you know, all that stuff, that's, there's a lot less of that these days, and there's a lot more um, artist-friendly deals where, you know, the label's maybe not as involved in other aspects of, of the deal, but they're, you know, they're more like distribution contracts, you know, so they're, um, they might only take a 20% cut, um, but they're still going to be involved, and they're still going to be working with you, and the artist is going to retain a lot more ownership than they would in that traditional 360 deal, so... I think there's there's definitely a shift towards deals like that um, because I think artists are getting savvier and, you know, you don't, I mean, I'm not saying you don't need a label because labels can be very, very helpful, but you don't, you literally don't need a label, you know, anymore. Now you can, you can release music on your own. I mean, there's plenty of avenues to release music without a label, so um you know, labels have to be more competitive than they used to because they know that, you know, if this artist is popping off, if you're popping off independently, you know, and you're paying distro kid $50 a year and keeping 100% of your royalties, and that's a significant amount of money, why are you going to give up half or more of that to a label, you know, when you're building the machine on your own, you know, so um, label contracts are definitely, they're, they're much more competitive now than they used to be competitive, meaning that they're, you know, they're in the ballpark of what you would get from distribution just because they have to be, Mm -hmm. you know, or else nobody would do a label deal these days. It's fascinating how the market changes like that. Um, Because my mind was coming, because I was going to bring up a 360 deal contract. The infamous was maybe almost 10 years ago now at this point, the Joe Budden, Lil Yachty moment. Sure, yeah, yeah. Where it's like, you don't don't know if you're in a 360 deal? Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. What are some things that maybe artists don't know about 360 deal? I imagine they still exist in the market. They do, they do, yeah. Um, Yeah, I mean, with a 360 deal, like you're giving up, you know, your your master rights, you're giving up publishing, you're giving up merchandise even, which is a, a big part of it. You know, that's a, that's a big income source. And, you know, the label kind of, you know, they kind of own you at that point. You know, like they, they're much more in charge of, of your creative. They're much more in charge of how you release, when you release, um, what you're able to release and not release. You know, and that's, that's what people think of a lot of times when they think of a traditional you know, a, a big label contract. Um, but like I said, I think labels are more flexible these days, even at the bigger levels, you know, even the majors are, are more flexible about, you know, not signing artists into these, these deals and, and instead, you know, working with them to, to grow, you know, the brand. Dope. Uh, one of my friends asked me, uh, 
you're saying that the labels seem a little bit more flexible in these years than maybe they were at the turn of the digital streaming age where mm -hmm. they were just trying to figure out things themselves. But it does still seem like labels sometimes are still controlling uh, in the sense of like delaying releases until there's like that viral moment that kind of feels like it can springboard a song. Sure. Is there ways that artists can maybe negotiate their contract, to, especially if they're an artist that hasn't had that viral, that hasn't had a big uh, fan base yet? How do they go about being able to retain their control over releasing at least? Yeah, honestly, if you haven't had that viral moment and you don't have that audience, you probably shouldn't be talking to a label. You know, that's first off. Like, um, yeah, labels are much more hesitant to develop artists these days, whereas back in the day they would invest money in, in developing you and, and, and creating that sort of viral moment. Now it's kind of the opposite. You know, you need to have. Your, you need to have your audience first and then the label will come in and say like, okay, you know, you're at, you're at 50, let's get you to 100. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not, they're not going to get you from zero to 100 anymore, but they're going to get you from, from 60 or 70 to 100, you know. So um, if you haven't had that moment yet, I would say, you know, it's with leverage wise, you're probably better off staying independent and doing your own thing. Um, and building the audience on your own than you are going with a label and taking a more unfavorable deal. Because, like I said, if you haven't had that viral moment, if you haven't had the big hit, they're much less likely to give you a favorable deal, you know. Um, and they're much less likely to talk to you in general, you know. Definitely. So. And even kind of looking at it from an objective business standpoint, right, in a market that is so saturated where, like you said, at one point you needed a record label because you needed to press the label, you right. needed to be able to ship it out to distributors, you needed da 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 Where it's like nowadays, it's like, maybe if you're not willing to get to 40, you're not willing to get to 50% on your own. It's like, how dedicated are you to this, that's, right? That's also true. It's also true. Because, yeah, any artist can make this happen on their own. It, it takes a lot of work, a lot of luck, you know, but you can do it on your own. Like you don't, again, you don't, you literally don't need a label, but it, it, it can help, you know. And I saw, uh, I don't even know what they call it, not a tweet on threads, but yeah. it kind of made me laugh a little bit where, uh, at least in this where it's like, you know, an artist thinks like, oh, if I sign to a record label, they're going to blow me up and everything. And it's like, that's not realistic, right? right? You need to do the ground foot just so that they even want to have the conversation to put you to a hundred but what is it with artists thinking that they can get a big name feature and that'll just blow them up? Oh yeah, oh I, I've had a lot of artists think that they're like, oh I got you know I got 10k, I'm gonna get this feature from so and so, and then that's gonna you know that's gonna blow me up, and you know it it could if it's a good feature and if the the featured artist actually promotes it, you know, and that's where I say like. You know, if you're dropping, you know, 10 bands or something on a feature or, or whatever it is, you got to get a good contract with that featured artist mm -hmm. that says, that stipulates that, you know, you can, you can have the featured artist be listed as a primary artist on Spotify so that it shows up on their Spotify page. Or you got to have, you know, stipulations in there where the, the featured artist um, agrees to be in the music video or agrees to do some promotional shots or just agrees to share and post the the song altogether because I mean there's tons of artists you know that do a lot of features and most of them get buried because the artist themselves the featured artist is not promoting you know the feature so um, if you can get a good contract with a featured artist that stipulates what's expected of them out of it then you know a feature can really be helpful but at the end of the day it's still not going to blow you up on your own you know again unless it's like the greatest song of all time or the or a really great feature like at the end of the day you know you you still need to put in the work to be consistent release your own music um and and work on that consistent quality versus just putting all your eggs in oh i got this feature from gucci Mane or whatever you know speaking of that uh just studio conversations with artists is kind of fascinating that you'd think like the biggest issue is that getting an artist to sign a contract that says, yeah, I'll go halfway with you as far as promotion, as far as this versus that. One that I found crazy is just having a conversation. How many artists have, underground artists, upcoming artists, have a big name feature mm -hmm. that they can't put out because they can't get it clear from the label that the artist is assigned to? Yeah, and that happens all the time because in addition to getting a contract, with the artists themselves, you also need what's called a label waiver if they're if they're on a major label, 
Um, and that's, you know, something from the label agreeing that like, Hey, even, you know, we're the label and we have this artist contractually, um, you know, contracted to our label, but we're going to waive our rights so that you can release this song, you know, with the artist. And that, that can be hard to obtain too, because, you know, if it's not something that's going to be helpful for the artist, why, what incentive does the label have to let their artist, you know, feature on your song? So, you know, these are definitely things you got to figure out up front. It's a lot more involved than just like, you know, getting a DM and, the, and sending the artist, you know, a thousand dollars on cash app and then, then, you know, getting the verse, like you still need these clearances and you need the label waiver so that you can legally release something, you know, and then, and there's nothing worse than like not thinking you don't need these things, releasing it. And then the next thing you know, you get a DMCA takedown notice from, from universal or whatever. And now your song is taken off the internet and you put in all this time and effort into promotion and releasing and getting it out there. And then whew, it's gone. That's going to be my next question. Is there any ways to get around that type of clearance? Because obviously if you put it out on Spotify, Apple, or whatever, you're screwed. Yeah. But is there a way to like put it out for free or to put it out a different way? Maybe it's in yeah. a movie that you're filming or something. Is it, there any way to work it? It doesn't matter. No. You know, um, our artists ask me that all the time. They're like, well, I got, I got these samples and I use this beat that I don't have the license for, but I'm just going to release it on SoundCloud. So it should be fine, right? And it's like, well, technically you're still... Uh, committing copyright infringement, you know, even if you're releasing something for free, you can't, you can't use it. Hmm. Um, so, you know, that's definitely not, it's not a way around the system. Um, you, they can still come after you even if you're not making any money off of the project, you know. So, technically you can't do that. Um, but, you know, people do it. Do it, do it <laughs> people, out, right? people do it. You know, if you get in trouble, call me, I'll help you out. Hey, man, right here, bro. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I do find that kind of funny because uh, how many friends I have that like they'll sample a really popular song. And I like, I kind of went through my face like, go ahead, see if you catch me, right? Yeah, but then yeah, it got yeah. to the point where I like, I actually did start going through, because the, there, there is means like track lib, right? Where you mm -hmm. can actually go click, get a song cleared and everything properly, where it's like, why do I even want to put myself at risk? I remember there was an artist who had a viral TikTok, right? I don't know how much money he made off the song, but apparently when it got back to whoever the parent company that owned the sample... He ended up owing them something in the eight hundred thousand range or something. Oof, yeah. Uh, so it's it's definitely it's a it's scary a lot. Game. It's a lot. So yeah, because typically, so this is this is a good example of why you should copyright your music because if you actually have the registered copyright for your music and somebody infringes on that copyright, you get what's called statutory damages which can be up to $250,000 per infringement. So that's where that money comes you into play. Hit a you know, that, that can rack up really, really quickly if they have the registered copyright. And you can go on, you know, to the copyright office yourself and register your own song so that if something like that does happen to you, you would get those damages as well. You know? That's crazy. Being like an independent artist going through that, it's like bad enough when you get a collection agency hit you oh, up for yeah. a late bill or something. But right. you get somebody like, you owe us $800,000. It's like, I'm not even signed to the record label. Yeah. How am I going to recoup this? No, that's it. I mean, you're, you know, you know, and a lot of times, you know, you'll, the the labels will, will kind of settle with you because they know, you, they know you don't have that money, you know, but, you know, it's definitely going to cause problems for your music career. You know, it's going to, it's going to delay any momentum that you had because now you're you're dealing with this copyright infringement issue. Could you push the merch for that, or would the label technically be able to try to see some of that merch money, even if there isn't? It, it depends on what what they have trademarked and what um, you know what merch you're selling. You know, like if you're if you're selling like merch that has direct lyrics from the thing that you're you're cop you're infringing on. Then maybe the label could come after you, you know. If not, um, yeah. I mean, I've seen I've seen people try to get clever with uh, with samples and and stuff, and say like, you know, I'm not selling the song. I'm selling this T-shirt, and you get the song for free with the T-shirt. You know, it's like okay. But again, it goes back to what I was saying earlier that if you you know, even if you're not making any money off of the song, you you're still committing copyright infringement at the end of the day at the know. end of the day yeah so we've mentioned it a couple of times and um 
I know I saw a tweet thread, whatever, yeah. of uh, an, an artist that you manage or represent that recently signed an artist-friendly deal. Yeah. What would you say some of the characteristics of an artist-friendly deal? Yeah, so, so this one in particular, I, I can't get into the specifics just yet because the artist hasn't formally announced the signing yet. And I, I know that there's a big plan for the rollout for that. Um, for that artist, but um, you know, in this case, it was uh, it was a short term, low commitment deal. So I think it was just you know like one album, you know, not uh, you know not three albums, not five albums, not ten albums, one album, um, short term, you know, commitment. They want the album out within six months, so that's that's artist friendly too, because you know you're not going to get put on the shelf. You know your album's going to come out within six months. You know. Um, there was a decent advance for the artist, which is always great. Um, but the also they also gave the artist uh, a much more friendly back end term. So the artist is rather than a lot of label deals, you'll see, you know, it might be 50 50, it might be 60 40 in the label's favor, 70 30 in the label's favor. You know, this one was in the artist's favor. So the artist is getting a lot more um, back end royalties than the label would even be getting. So, like I said, it's kind of structured almost like a distribution deal, but with a major label. Um, so that was, that was something where that artist in particular, you know, and again, if I name names, you, you might know who I'm talking about, but the, you know, they had a big viral moment. They had a, a sound go crazy on TikTok that led to a ton of streams on Spotify that they were doing independently, you know, so because they were doing so well independently, they had this leverage that they could say, you know, you know, no, I'm not going to sign. I'm just going to stick with what I'm doing independently, you know, but the labels want a part of that viral success and that hype, you know, so they're willing to cut a much more artist favorable, artist friendly deal because they want in on, on the momentum, you know? Mm -hmm. So yeah, that, that was, that's a, that's a good deal. And I, I'm going to be excited to, to share it once the artist is ready to share. And, you know, once that machine starts rolling for him, yeah. Is that, uh, you don't have to go into the specifics of this deal necessarily, but with a deal in that realm, it seems like a major distribution one of the, or a major label, one of the biggest things that they can give you is that marketing power that they have behind Absolutely. you. Do you have access to that in an artist-friendly deal, or are they kind of like, we want to attach our name, give you money, but you're kind of responsible for pushing it? No, no, in this deal in particular, the, they broke out the advance, so, you know, they broke it down where you know, a portion of the advance would would be used specifically for marketing, you know, so it was a marketing advance in addition to the traditional royalty advance. So um, the marketing is going to be a big part of of why the artist signed the label to begin with. Understood. Yeah. Um, for artists that are in the game of networking, it seems like some artists are a little bit scared, scared to leave the house sometimes. Yeah. And then there's other artists that want to go, but they don't know where yeah. to go. What are some underrated Mark, uh, networking opportunities that you've come across? Yeah, I think, um, you know, if you're afraid, if you're afraid to leave your house, first off, I get it. The world's crazy. So, you know, no shame there, but, um, you'd be surprised at, at the, the value that you can gain from just a cold email to, to people in the industry, you know, but here's the key. You can't just, can't just, you know, find a list of, of A&R and executives and just email every single one. You got to do your research, you got to do your homework, and you got to know who you're targeting and why you're targeting them. And if it, if it makes sense, if you're reaching out to somebody who, you know, it makes sense to reach out to, you'd be surprised at how responsive a lot of people are to, to just a cold email. You know, like if, if uh, you know, if, you, if you're trying to... If you're, I, I see this a lot of time with, with sync and with sync licensing. So, you know, if you, if you, if you are making the type of music and you're like, man, this would be, my song would be perfect in this TV show or it'd be perfect, you know, for, for this type of thing. If you find the music supervisors that are doing that TV show, you can reach out to them directly and, and send them your music. And I, I've seen deals come just from that, you know. So I'd, I'd say networking means a lot of different things. It doesn't just mean, you know, showing up at, a, at an event and handing out business cards. Like it, it's any way that you connect with people and any way that you can, you know, build relationships. I mean, like you said, we, we connected on threads, you know. So it's like that's networking too is, is posting and, and just putting yourself out there is, 
is a big part of networking and there's there's a lot of different ways to do it even from the comfort of your own home you know now in a sense of that i know obviously it would be miraculous if you can uncover the treasured list of all the a and r names and sure all yeah, yeah. Like, that would be beautiful if like, yeah. somebody could sell that for i'm sure pretty I, I think there are people that do sell it and um it's not worth buying because you know um if, if you want a specific person you can find that that person's email you know so. Best way about going through that is like going through LinkedIn or something. What do you? Yeah, think? maybe LinkedIn or you know a lot of people put their emails in their in their bios and stuff. Um, or you know the 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 main website for, um, you know for for the label or whoever it is. You know some people right straight up don't want to be contacted. You know so you just can't contact those people. But you know if somebody's putting their email out there, that means that they want they want to be contacted. So again, don't waste their time. Don't send you know. Uh, a hip hop song to a country A and R or whatever you know, but if if you're if you're targeting correctly and you're doing your homework, I think most people are going to be pretty responsive. Cool. A um, couple of other questions I saw connected to threads. Yeah. So you said be careful. I'm paraphrasing. Be careful of what the word exclusive means in a contract. Yes. What can exclusive sometimes mean that we're not aware of? Yeah. So sometimes you know exclusive means truly exclusive where you can't release any music with anybody else you have to only work with this this company for two years or three years or whatever the term is but sometimes exclusive can actually mean that you know what you release with them is exclusive so like if you release an album with a with a distributor that may have to stay with the distributor for a couple years but you could release album a with this distributor that's exclusive and then release album B with a different distributor and that could be exclusive to them, you know? So exclusive doesn't always mean all encompassing exclusive. Sometimes it's just for specific projects that are exclusive. Um, so you gotta be careful on the language there and make sure you know what you're signing up for and, and you know what, what exclusive is going to be. Um, cause that can, that can change your whole release strategy, you know? Mm -hmm. you th is it advantageous for artists to pursue like an exclusive with that, like exclusive with this, or are they better off trying to build familiarity with one company? Uh, I think it depends. It depends on what the companies are offering and what and what they're doing. You know, sometimes it can be good to be a little flexible, but um, there is something to be said about building with one company and um, you know, kind of sticking with it. I was I was talking with an artist um, the other day. Uh, shout out to. Uh, Busy Crook, you know Busy Crook. Familiar. Yeah, yeah he's Crook. he's got a great Threads account as well. I, um, but he he posted a, a great thread about um, uh, about he started with one specific distributor, like you know four or five years ago, and just stuck with them and built with them. And he he talks about how he never asked them to get an editorial placement on Spotify or, or Apple or whatever. Like he never asked for that. He just did his thing, did his thing, did his thing, built it to the point where now he's worthy of an editorial placement. And then he started contacting the distributor and they were like, well, yeah, you have all this history with us. Like, we'll do what we can for you. And now, like, everything that he drops basically gets editorial love, you know? Sweet. So so that's, you know, yeah, shout out to him because that, that's a good example of like, all right, you know, I'm going to build with somebody, but I'm not going to ask for anything, you know, because it's it's... It's easy to go in and start asking and making demands, but rather, you know, prove prove yourself, prove your worth, and then come back and say, like, hey, I've done this on my own. You know, I've been working with you guys, but I'm still kind of on my own. Can you provide me more resources? If you're doing things right, you're going to get those resources. Yeah, and that's that hustler's mentality, and that's yep. exactly what the record label is looking for. That's exactly right. They don't want to sit there and be like, oh, we put you on, we get you put you on, put you in the situation, and all of a sudden it's like, oh, I'm at the finish line. I can yeah. cake up now, put my feet up. Yeah, and yeah. And to be clear, an editorial placement on Spotify or Apple or whatever is not the finish line. Let me just put it that way. <laughs> it's great, it's helpful, but I always say playlisting is not a marketing plan. You know, playlisting is, uh, you know, a it's almost like the reward for having a good marketing plan. <laughs> you know, it's like you get... You get playlisted because you're doing things in other avenues to, to get yourself noticed. It's a symptom. Yeah, yeah. It's a, yeah, there you go. It's a symptom. I like that. Nice. Yeah. Uh, so another thing I saw I was a little bit curious about, when you hire, um, let's say, a content team or something like that, 
uh, you brought up the question of knowing who actually owns that content. Yeah, no, that's a really important issue and something that um, I'm seeing a lot more with with these, you know, uh, with influencers and content creators where, um, you know, if you're if you're making a, a content, if you know, if you're making a, a clip for Target, you know, or Walmart or whatever, um, you know, you need to be careful about, you know, do you own that clip? Or does Target own that clip? Ooh. You know, like who who does? Or you know, or the other way around. If you're you know, if you're a musician, you know, and you're hiring somebody to make you know even a music video or whatever for you, like, do you own that footage, or does the music video videographer, you know, do they own that footage? You know, and that's that's a really big question because um, technically, you know, if without an agreement. Uh, transferring the copyright like you know if, if you get pictures taken the photographer owns the copyright you know not you even if even if you're the one in the picture okay so that's why you need a document you need something that that transfers that and says like okay uh, I'm I, I'm a photographer I'm a work for, this is a work for hire I'm gonna take these pictures but the pictures are gonna be owned by the subject you know, gotcha. I didn't actually think like that's something I'm familiar with with photography. How many people sure. go to record, uh, go to shows and whatnot, take photos, and then they put them up and they own them and they can sell them off to Gettys or whatever. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. But uh, is that a situation where like possession is nine tenths of the law, where it's like if you have the photos and the artist or the photographer doesn't have the photos, like they literally gave you the USB or whatever, uh -huh. is that then kind of muddy it a little bit it does i mean i think if they give you the usb and they don't have the photos anymore then i guess it's your photo you know <laughs> but um it's definitely something to be very clear on you know i i um i i dealt with a situation again I, you know i can't get into super specifics but um a situation where an artist um just like you said they were at they they performed a show and what's crazier is the show was at their house it was a house show um and they uh there was a picture of them um, doing something, and I, I can't remember. And they, um, a photographer took this picture, put the picture in an art gallery, and was actually selling prints of this photo of this artist. But um, the art, like, I, I can't, I wish I could get into specifics, but the <laughs> artist wasn't really, they weren't really in the picture, but it was something that they did during their performance, you know? So, um, it, it was definitely like you could tell it was the artist's work, but you know the photographer technically owns that copyright and that's their photo. So I mean, if they want to sell it or whatever, they can do it. But it just you know the artist was very upset because they're like, I did this performance, I did it at my own house, I invited this person into my house, and they you know basically took my art and now they're monetizing it. And I understand how that's super frustrating, but that's you know that's how it is. Even more frustrating on top of that, a lot of photographers aren't doing this for free. Of course. So it's like if you pay a photographer 150 200 whatever the magic number is, right? And yeah. then it's like, oh, and you still own this and you can still, yeah. that's something that you didn't even think of really. Yeah, that's why you, that's why you need contracts, you know, because you need, you know, to transfer a copyright, you legally need a written document that transfers the copyright. You can't just say, all right, yeah, I'll give you the photos, they're yours. You can't just say that. Like you need the written um documentation or else it's not going to be legally valid hmm. is that something like as easy as just pulling up like a napkin and writing down terms or you think like no you're going to find some loopholes that are going to screw you yeah i mean i it's better to get a professional yeah. contract done but um if you can get a napkin or whatever i mean that's that's better than nothing you know gotcha uh another question one of my music homies uh it kind of like taking one of his questions one of my questions put it together let's say uh, whether it's a music video or a song, if they're very different situations, by all means, we can break them down. But music video or a song, let's say you've already handled whatever compensation you think it was required for the model in your music video or the singer on your track, right? Mm -hmm. But you don't have like an actual contract with them. Are they able to, you know, after the fact, come out and ask for some more compensation if they feel like the video went viral and they didn't have a moment in there or the song went off and they're sitting there like, oh, you only gave me X percentage of the song. Mm -hmm. I actually want this now too. Is there is that something that you can run into? Yeah, no, this happens all the time, mm -hmm. you know, and um, with the music video and the model example, you need a model release form that, you know, 
gives the gives you permission to use this model's name, image, likeness, you know, to use their, you know, to use them in your in your in your content. Same thing if you have a singer or somebody on a song, you need a contract that you know, if you're giving them a percentage, it spells out that percentage. If it's just a work for hire and they're not getting a percentage, they're just getting like, you just pay them, you know, 500 bucks or whatever it is to sing on the song. You need a contract that states that too, because if not, yeah, I've seen, I've seen whole albums get taken down because they didn't clear something with one singer or one featured artist or whatever, you know, so go that extra step, get that paperwork done, you know, it's, it's super important. It's more important than most people realize, I think, because, um, you know, it's one of those things where like 90% of the time there's not going to be a problem. You're going to be okay. But that 10% can really mess you up. Gotcha. Yeah. Yeah. Is that, um, is that situation where like a paper trail of text messages could be helpful or like non text messages, a text message, not legally bonding? I mean, it can be helpful once you're in court and need to provide evidence, but at that point, you're already spending the money on court fees and everything, you know? So it's like, if you just had a contract from the very beginning, that can, you know... Square that it can, away. Yeah, that can shut everything else down. Nice. Know? Okay. Uh, well, I can't lie. I ran out of my written questions, no, so I would no, no longer good. be looking at my phone. But, yeah. Uh, yeah, I guess... Is there any other like interesting tidbits maybe past week month that like you feel artists could maybe learn to benefit or they need to do their own due diligence on? Um, good question. I think, um, yeah, like I said, you know, basically at the end of the day, if you take anything from this, it's that if you're working with anybody else in the industry, if you're collaborating in some way, whether that be a producer a featured artist, a model in a music video, a singer on your on your hook or whatever. If you're if if there's anybody else involved, you should have a contract. You know, um, if it's just you in your bedroom doing everything all on your own, never working with anybody, you probably don't need a contract. But if you're if you're actively collaborating with anybody in the industry, you should have contracts because people's expectations are very different, and what people want out of things are very different. And, you know, somebody might think you said this or think you said that or think you agreed to that. No, you need to have it all on paper. You need to have it, you know, in contract form um, or else you're going to run into problems. So so that, that's my biggest tidbit. And I, I've been, you know, I've been shouting this from the rooftops for a while now for artists. It's like, please get collaboration agreements, get contracts, just, you know, even if it's your homie, if it's your best friend, if it's your brother, I, it doesn't matter. You, you still need a contract, you know, and, and the best time to get a contract is when you're not arguing, you know, when you're, when you don't have an issue, when you're just, just getting started. That's the best time to put the contract together because it's a lot easier to negotiate. Everybody's looking out for everyone else's best interests. Whereas if you wait till there's a dispute and you wait till there's an issue, it's going to be a lot harder to negotiate a favorable deal for both sides when you're at each other's throats, you know? So that's my biggest tidbit is, you know, get, get collaboration agreements, get agreements with anybody that you're working with. Yeah. You know? I feel like that's maybe a lane or something that like, I'm glad I'm hearing this because yeah. for me, I've, I have been like that DIY, like I got tired of grabbing beats off of YouTube. So I was like, I can make my own beats. Yeah. And then I went from like, oh, I used to not like how I sing on tracks. No, I can kind of sing on a track where it's <laughs> like, kind of get locked into that. But at the same time, one of the ways to grow in the industry is by collaborating. It's Absolutely. by you know, cross pollinating each other's discographies and whatnot. Yeah. So it's kind of a dangerous game. Once you try to breach out from yourself and being like, oh man, I didn't realize some of the issues I could bump into. Yeah, no, it is. It's a, it's, it's a crazy world out there. And like I said, you just never know what the other person's thinking, you know? So if you can get that formalized in a contract, you're, you're going to be a step ahead of a lot of other people, you know? This might be a little left field or something, but kind of curious with virtual reality and like NFTs and all this, mm -hmm. it's like, that was a fad maybe X amount of years ago, but it still seems like it's around the culture. It just hasn't had that spike moment in recent years. Sure. Is that, is there anything changing in that landscape that artists should be aware of? Yeah. I mean, I think with that, it's, you know, the big question mark right now is, is AI, you know, mm -hmm. artificial intelligence or Apple intelligence, whatever they call it now. <laughs> um, 
it's uh you know it's it, it has all sorts of questions about ownership and and who owns the material you know if, if you you're if you're using an ai to to create to write lyrics you know which i've seen people do you know it's like does the ai own the lyrics or do you own the lyrics like you know are they cuz cuz ai is taking bits of information from you know a large pool of resources so like it's it's hard to say where that ownership comes from that happens a lot with images too so if you're using cover art that you got through an ai source you might not actually own that cover art you know so that could be that could be an issue down the line too and that's one thing where there's there's still a lot of um there's there's still a lot of like discussion around that and there's there's not a lot of hard and set rules on ai yet so i would just say be careful using ai for for anything creative just because you really don't know uh where it's going to go or, or what you know what regulations are going to be put into place in the future he might turn into the case study yeah yeah no i i you never know you know anything could be a case study so um, so yeah, it's AI is, AI is the next frontier. I think, you know, I think, I think we're kind of past NFTs and that, and that kind of thing. I know there's some, still some people that are into it, but I think for the mainstream, that wasn't really a thing that was adopted, but, but AI is, is rapidly being adopted, rapidly being used and, you know, used for all sorts of ways. It's, it's interesting. It's almost a shame to me, you know, like I think AI, you know, I wish AI could, you know, people are using AI for creative endeavors and I'd much rather use AI for like the boring stuff that I don't want to do. And, you know, like I don't want I don't want AI to speed up my creative. I want AI to speed up, you know, doing laundry for me <laughs> and then like giving me more time to be creative. You know what I mean? Yeah. So uh, it's I think it's kind of backwards right now. But but yeah, we'll see in the next couple of years where AI goes. And that's something that, you know, I've been trying to stay on top of and, you know, reading articles and, and, and learning as much as I can about the way it works because yeah, I think it's going to be, you know, for, for future generations of artists, it's going to be a very big thing. Hmm. Do you think it's more likely that the major, I mean, it could be equally as likely, but that the major distributions will, uh, you know, take AI or, uh, put it into their process, at least from an administrative standpoint, yeah. or that the same way an artist can go to Dolly or Mid Journey or something and get that, that they could use that for administrative work. You yeah, see I, way. I think the, so so the labels recently sued um, a couple AI companies um, for, for using what they say is their copyrighted work, you know? Um, but I think that's only because the labels haven't figured out a way to monetize it for themselves. But I think, you know, any company's out there for money. So I think once they can figure out a way to monetize it and use it in a way that makes them money, they're going to do it. Every company is going to do it. So, yeah, I think I think that's coming for sure. Sweet. Yeah. More to look forward to. More to look forward to. More, you know, takeover of, uh, of the robots. Yeah, you know. Terminator coming soon, guys. Yes, yes. Skynet, it's a thing. Yeah, yeah. Wild times we live in, though. But. Yeah. Just trying to live out our passions and our dreams while we can, right? Exactly, exactly. While we're do, what, do what you can, you know. Well, you've been great, Randy. Thank you, man. Oh, thanks for having me, man. Yeah, I, do you I have, appreciate uh, it. Any last words to say to the people? Where can they see you at? Where can they get at you? Yeah, I'm uh, real Randy Ojeda on all the socials. You know, don't follow the fake Randy Ojeda. Follow the real Randy Ojeda. That's me. You know, I'm really accessible. DM me, email me, you know, whatever. Um, always happy to talk. I also offer um, free 15-minute consultations for any artist. You know, I, I, I truly believe that, you know, this information should be out there and, and you know, I'm, I'm here to help. So if you want to do a, a quick consultation with me, um, you can book that on my website, randyohadalaw.com. And, uh, you know, if you need me for, for more in-depth work, um, then please feel free to hire me and, you know, reach out about that and I, I'd, I'd love to work with anybody especially especially people in the Tampa Bay area you know my my uh, practice is about you know half and half where like half are, are local half are all over the place so I'd, I'd love that local aspect to increase you know come by the office come hang out you know you can you can look at the plaque or whatever you want to do you know 
Oh, yeah. Thank so, you, man. Cool. Yes, sir. Thanks, man.